Chapter 61 God's Promise Numbers 33, 1-56 These are the journeys of the children of Israel, which went forth out of the land of Egypt with their armies under the hand of Moses and Aaron. And Moses wrote their goings out according to their journeys by the commandment of the Lord. And these are their journeys according to their goings out. And they departed from Mamses in the first month, on the fifteenth day of the first month, on the morrow after the Passover the children of Israel went out with an high hand in the sight of all the Egyptians. For the Egyptians buried all their firstborn, which the Lord had smitten among them, Upon their gods also the Lord executed judgments. And the children of Israel removed from Ramesses and pitched in Succoth. And they departed from Succoth and pitched in Atham, which is in the edge of the wilderness. And they removed from Atham and turned again unto Pihiroth, which is before Baal Zephon, and they pitched before Migdol. And they departed from before Piharoth, and passed through the midst of the sea into the wilderness, and went three days' journey in the wilderness of Etham, and pitched in Marah. And they removed from Marah, and came unto Elam, and in Elam were twelve fountains of water, and threescore and ten palm trees, and they pitched there. And they removed from Elam, and encamped by the Red Sea. And they removed from the Red Sea and encamped in the wilderness of Sin. And they took their journey out of the wilderness of Sin and encamped in Dovka. And they departed from Dovka and encamped in Alush. And they removed from Alush and encamped in Rephidim, where was no water for the people to drink. And they departed from Rephidim and pitched in the wilderness of Sinai. And they removed from the desert of Sinai and pitched at Kibroth Hatava. And they departed from Kibroth Hatava and encamped at Hazaroth. And they departed from Hazaroth and pitched at Rithma. And they departed from Rithma and pitched at Rimon Perez. And they departed from Rimon Perez and pitched in Libna. And they removed from Libna and pitched at Riza. And they journeyed from Riza and pitched in Kehelitha. And they went from Kehelitha and pitched in Mount Shaffer. And they removed from Mount Shaffer and encamped in Harada. And they removed from Harada and pitched in Makaloth. And they removed from Makaloth and encamped at Tahath. And they departed from Tahath and pitched at Tara. And they removed from Tara and pitched in Mithka. And they went from Mithka and pitched in Hashmona. And they departed from Hashmona and encamped at Mozaroth. And they departed from Mozaroth and pitched in Benijakan. And they removed from Benijakan and encamped at Horhagidgad. And they went from Horhagidgad and pitched in Jothbatha. And they removed from Jothbatha and encamped at Ebruna. And they departed from Ebruna and encamped at Ezion Gaber. And they removed from Ezion Gaber and pitched in the wilderness of Sin, which is Kadesh. And they removed from Kadesh and pitched in Mount Hor in the edge of the land of Edom. And Aaron the priest went up into Mount Hor at the commandment of the Lord and died there. In the fortieth year after the children of Israel were come out of the land of Egypt, in the first day of the fifth month. And Aaron was an hundred and twenty and three years old when he died in Mount Hor. And King Arad the Canaanites, which dwelt in the south in the land of Canaan, heard of the coming of the children of Israel, and they departed from Mount Hor and pitched in Salmona. And they departed from Zalmona and pitched in Punon. And they departed from Punon and pitched in Oboth. And they departed from Oboth and pitched in 
E.J. Barim, in the border of Moab. And they departed from Yim and pitched at Dibon Gad. And they removed from Dibon Gad and encamped in Almon de Blathium. And they removed from Almon de Blathium and pitched in the mountains of Abiram before Nebo. And they departed from the mountains of Abiram and pitched in the plains of Moab by Jordan near Jericho. And they pitched by Jordan from Beth Jeshemoth even unto Abel Shittim in the plains of Moab. And the Lord spake unto Moses in the plains of Moab by Jordan near Jericho, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When ye are passed over Jordan into the land of Canaan, then ye shall drive out all the inhabitants of the land from before you, and destroy all their pictures, and destroy all their molten images, and quite pluck down all their high places. And ye shall dispossess the inhabitants of the land, and dwell therein, for I have given you the land to possess it. And ye shall divide the land by lot for an inheritance among your families, and to the more ye shall give the more inheritance, and to the fewer ye shall give the less inheritance. Every man's inheritance shall be in the place where his lot falleth, according to the tribes of your fathers ye shall inherit. But if ye will not drive out the inhabitants of the land from before you, then it shall come to pass that those which ye let remain of them shall be pricks in your eyes and thorns in your sides, and shall vex you in the land wherein ye dwell. Moreover, it shall come to pass that I shall do unto you as I thought to do unto them. Numbers 33, 1-56 Numbers 33, 1-49 is a recapitulation of Israel's journey from Egypt to the Jordan recorded by Moses as an historical record. It has as its purpose also to remind Israel of how many years they spent in the wilderness because of their unbelief and rebellion. There are three sections to this recapitulation. First, Moses cites the march from Egypt to Sinai in verses 1 to 15. Then, second, he lists the 21 encampments from Sinai to Kadesh. Their 37 years of wandering are recorded in the encampments of verses 19 to 36, from Rithma to Kadesh. Finally and third, the move from Kadesh to the Jordan is given in verses 37 to 49. This is an historical record, but an unflattering one, because it is a reminder of the fact that God kept them in the wilderness until the older generation died. It is therefore a reminder of sin. This is echoed in Daniel 9, where Daniel confesses the long history of of Israel's apostasies. It is again the background of the public confession of sins in Nehemiah 9. Psalm 106 is the great rehearsal of Israel's journey and sin. Israel, past and present, is presented as a people presuming on God's grace and failing to keep his covenants and its law. Because confession is necessary before restoration, Psalm 106 was a constant reminder that Israel was a straying and apostate people, and God's mercies, many as they are, do not go on unendingly where men persist in their sin. As Kirkpatrick commented on Psalm 106, The national history is one long record of failure to understand God's purpose and of resistance to his will. The people loved a lie, their own lies, rather than the truth of God. Curiously, verse 12 is a favourite among devout Jews to this day, because Elam had twelve springs of water and seventy palm trees. This is allegorised to symbolise the twelve tribes of Israel and the seventy elders of the Sanhedrin. This kind of interpretation, common to both synagogue and church, replaces meaning with symbolism. 
Not all campsites are listed here. In verse 8, we read that they journeyed three days at one point. Obviously, they did not travel night and day. It is the important campsites that are listed, and those on their journey, so that the encampment on the shore of the Red Sea after the destruction of Egypt's army is not listed. Some of these campsites are still identifiable. Others, because there has been no further history of consequence attached to those sites by Israel or any other people, have been forgotten and cannot be located with any assurance. Joseph Parker, in commenting on this chapter, made a telling observation about history and biography. He said, Life is twice written. It is written once and authoritatively and perfectly as God knows it. It is written again in another form in man's memory and man's records. The story of this journey, the various biblical accounts of it in numbers as elsewhere, is part of God's unerring historical record. Man's histories are usually written in contradiction to God's realities. James Philip writes that the word journeys in verse 1 is sometimes rendered stages. One commentator has seen the Hebrew word as related to one that means plucking up, that is, taking up the tent pegs before resuming the march. There's an interesting fact about this wilderness journey. Once God had sentenced them to remain in the wilderness, their journeys were in part to locate grazing lands. On occasion, they were close enough to Egypt to make a return to it possible. In their rebellion against God and Moses, they could have easily separated themselves and returned to their land of captivity. It is a grim fact that no actual move was made to return to Egypt. Their attitude was like so many people today. Their lust was for the securities of slavery together with the advantages of freedom. So men move and act today. Their whole lives are a lie because they refuse to face up to what they are and they mask their demands for slavery as expressions of freedom and independence. Israel never returned to Egypt physically during the wilderness years, but it remained in Egypt spiritually. This travel account is interrupted by reference to the death of Aaron near the end of their travels, verses 38 and 39. Despite his earlier weakness, Aaron had become a faithful high priest, and God here requires that we take note of his death as an important event. In verses 50 to 56, God gives instructions concerning Israel's treatment of the Canaanites. Israel had come from Egypt, which morally was far superior to Canaan, although their religion was a wretched one. Canaan was a place of radical depravity. It was, apart from private or personal sins, given to religious prostitution, including sodomy and bestiality. Our Winterbottom summed up God's requirements in these words. Consider therefore, 1. That the one great duty of Israel in taking possession of his own land was wholly to dispossess the natives as being enemies of God and of his worship. 2. That Israel was further required to abolish all their monuments of idolatry, however pleasing and interesting. 3. That the command to exterminate seemed hard and was ungrateful, no doubt, to most in Israel. 4. That, as a fact, the command to extirpate was not obeyed. 5. That, as a fact, the other command was not obeyed wholly. Sometimes graven images were served. Sometimes high places turned to the worship of the Lord to the great detriment and danger of the true faith. 6. That the remnants of the heathen, if spared, were to become pricks and thorns, that is, constant and dangerous annoyances to them, and would vex them. 7. That the end of such unfaithfulness, if not amended, 
was to be expatriation. God, as the landlord of Canaan and all the earth, gave a specific order for the eviction of the Canaanites. Their way of life is often described in Scripture as an abomination. God, as Lord over all, can and does evict nations repeatedly in history. Here he gives a specific command to Israel to do so. Winterbottom's summary of what was to be done is again worth citing. Consider again, with respect to Canaan, 1. That Israel was to possess it, because God had given it to them. It was his, and he chose to do so. No such title was ever granted to any people. 2. That the grant of Canaan to Israel implied all necessary succour in conquering and occupying it, else had the name of God been disgraced. 3. That the division of the land was so ordered that equality should as far as possible be preserved and favouritism made impossible. 4. That the Holy Land was delimited before they entered, but the boundaries are to a considerable extent unknown. 5. That the limits marked down were apparently the natural limits of Canaan, without any reservations. 6. The land actually occupied by Israel was both larger and smaller than delimited, not reaching so far from south to north, yet not so straight from west to east. 7. That Kadesh, of famous memory, was specially included in the southern frontier. 8. That the land was allotted to the people by Eleazar their priest and Joshua their captain. 9. That together with them there acted princes from each tribe, that justice might be manifestly done to all. God required that all links with paganism be broken. Verses 50 to 56. The land was not merely to be occupied, but also cleansed. Failure to cleanse the land would mean troubles and finally dispossession. Israel was required to obey because God is the Lord, the Sovereign. The opening declaration of the Ten Commandments and a prefix to all the laws is I am the Lord thy God, Exodus 22. God, as the Sovereign Creator, has the absolute right to require whatever he wills, and no man can stay as will. In verse 55, Israel is told, But if ye will not drive out the inhabitants of the land from before you, then it shall come to pass that those which ye let remain shall be pricks in your eyes, and thorns in your sides, and shall vex you in the land wherein ye dwell. This is a conditional curse. The terms are spelled out and the people are told exactly what the consequences of disobedience are. Matthew Henry observed, Let us hear this and fear. If we do not drive sin out, sin will drive us out. If we be not the death of our lusts, our lusts will be the death of our souls. God does not allow any compromise of his sovereignty. Men try to lay down rules as to how God should act to be truly God, and this is blasphemy. God tells us who he is. We cannot prescribe a character for God in terms of our thinking, but this is what most men do. Perhaps the words of G. Campbell Morgan on verse 56 are the best conclusion. The most solemn word of all was the last uttered, and it shall come to pass that, as I thought to do unto them, so will I do unto you. In these words is revealed an abiding principle, that God's election to blessing is never of persons without reference to conduct, but rather of character which expresses itself in obedience to his will.
It is a modern heresy to believe that all God's promises must be sweetness and light. God is not a politician running for the presidency, 